Many people thought that probably he didn't realize how big he was and everything around him. He knew exactly what was going on all the time. Fernando, Fernando. When Fernando Valenzuela began his incredible run with the Dodgers in 1981, he was a virtual mystery to the press and most fans. We knew he was a kid from Mexico who had arrived to Los Angeles with a wicked screwball that flummoxed batters, but his bio was a blank slate. Here's this young man from Echoaquia, small community in Mexico, speaks very little English, looks up to the top of his cap or to heaven as he delivers the ball. It was a great mystique about him. Right from the start, uh, it was a big deal. <laughs> you had to pay attention because number one, you had the backstory of Fernando, how he came out of nowhere. And then you had the fact that he was a, a, a Mexican kid, a kid from Mexico, which was rare and kind of exotic at the time in the major leagues. And you had the fact that he had burst onto the scene so quickly, won a couple of games his rookie year, had an unusual style and all that stuff and had brought the big following out of the Latino and Mexican fans. It was clear that this was a sensation that might last a week, or two weeks, or something like that. But while it was going, it was a big deal. The best part about it was just being there. To have it be my, my beat and my story, and to have it be as special as it was, I mean, you know, you don't get them like that. We'd have four or five, six people out there on some nights in a big game, uh, you know, doing everything from fans in the stands to uh, Fernando's style that night to what he did before the game. It was, this is Los Angeles. That was the same with Shaq. That was the same with Kobe. This is Hollywood and when there is a taste of a star, we go at it. And, and in those days, the you know, Los Angeles Times had the resources to go at it like no other paper. The local media was hungry to uncover the details, but access to Valenzuela was mostly limited to press conferences arranged by the team. He would do the press conferences after games when he pitched, and it was always kind of fairly brief and with a translator and uh, very little substance there. He'd always start every, every statement with bueno. It's, you'd ask him a question and he'd say, bueno, uh, I, I pitched pretty good tonight. I had my screwball working. and. Very basic stuff. He just didn't give you give you much color. He didn't speak the language at all. Uh, I don't know if he understood some. I don't think so. So the, in 1981, I started uh, being with Fernando. I was uh, really surprised to see the way he conducted himself. Many people thought that probably he didn't realize how big he was and everything around him. He knew exactly what was going on all the time. I think he knew what was happening. It's just a matter of saying, you know what? I'm going to lay back, stay in the side. There was this way, there was no problem, anything that happened or anything that, you know, if I, he didn't have to then uh, explain himself if anything went wrong. The only thing I know is uh, what's, what's going on on the field, you know, and, and really that's not surprised me. All the people or the, or the media want to talk. One thing about Fernando is, he never seemed to say the wrong things. Uh, he said, I'd rather stay quiet if I don't know how to answer the question. I said, good. And I remember, for instance, in New York, it was a madhouse at Shea Stadium. It was about at least 100 reporters. The strike was coming on soon, and they started asking very difficult questions about the strike. And he only said, look, I am here to pitch. I don't know much about, about contracts and, and, and things like that. So, Next question, please. He was good with the press because he didn't have, he couldn't talk to him. <laughs> I mean, that was good too. He, could, he couldn't say stupid things because he couldn't understand the language. But it didn't stop local media outlets like the LA Times and La Opinion from trying to learn more about the pitcher. He wasn't comfortable, was not comfortable doing uh, interviews. I understand that it was, it was hard for him. It was not his nature. He was out going around his teammates. He was very playful and, and they loved him and he got along great and... Fernando gave our photographer more access. But uh, Fernando, what happened was this, he was not a well-educated guy as far as uh, uh, academically. So he, he used to hang around with people that were also not very highly academically uh, uh, involved. So our photographer was also like a street guy out of Chihuahua, out of uh, Ciudad Juarez. So he, 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 they spoke the language. He said, hey, you know, how's somebody and so on. And they, 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 he became uh, very trustworthy for him and I became very buddy-buddy, so he, this guy used to take a box of balls and had a sign 
And the guy said, got, we'll laugh. We said, you know what? I, I, I paid my house without, without authorized, uh, or I mean, uh, signed, signed uh, memorabilia. So that's how well they got along at that point. The local papers may have been left trying to get Fernando Valenzuela's story, but Fernando Mania nevertheless had an enormous impact on them. I have no doubt that Fernando's success and, and the sensation he created and the energy he brought just created, I, I'm sure, more of an awareness of the Latino community in, in Los Angeles. And I have no doubt that that caused the Los Angeles Times and other papers to pay more attention to these people. Fernando pretty much, I would say, sold 60% over what, what was being sold before. I think Fernando did have an impact on our editorial judgment. It opened up some eyes. Uh, we, I know we gave more freedom and license to a guy like Frank Delamo, who wrote a lot about him, followed him closely, and, and I think Frank led the, the push for a Pulitzer Prize that, that we won. When you see your base of, of readership reacting the way they did to Fernando, you do not stop and say, well, we don't have to do these kind of stories because those people only read La Opinion. Those people are our people, and those people are readers, and so, yeah, let's take a look at a deeper thing, not based on baseball, and that's why and how we won a Pulitzer Prize. I think that is all connected. Mm -hmm.